Welcome back to the Malt Miller YouTube channel. Today we're looking at various different ways that you can carbonate your beer. So Jim, we all started somewhere with our homebrew journey. How did you use to carbonate your beer when you started? Well, two ways, Rob. First off, uh, I would do bottle priming. So I'd add sugar to the bottles. Quite often it was just a fairly unspecified teaspoon yeah. of sugar into a bottle before I filled the bottle and capped it. There was a time right at the beginning as well when I was using a pressure barrel mm. and I would adopt a similar method for that. So I'd add all the priming sugar into the pressure barrel, yeah. put the finished beer into there and let it carbonate. But that came with loads of pitfalls of leaky vessels and beer not getting carbonated properly. Definitely, yeah. How about you? I was a massive advocate of bottle conditioning beer with actual sugar dose in the bottles. And yeah. I had my own method for doing that. I'd worked out through experimentation how much sugar to use in each individual bottle. It always worked really well for me. However, and it still works really well now in certain styles of yeah. beer. And this is what we really want to get to because some of the more modern styles of beer don't suit bottle conditioning. No, and actually some of the very traditional styles of beer as well, if we think about some stuff that maybe lays in tradition outside of the UK, yep. you know, European lagers, Czech lagers, that kind of stuff, where actually you want extended bulk maturation of your product, right? Yeah, sure, you're not gonna bottle condition those products for various different reasons, but one of them being that you don't want sediment in the bottom of those bottles, so it's not ideal for those styles. No, but as you said, there are some styles where it really does lend itself. Ah, oh, awesome. So the traditional British beers, whether that be a bitter, a best bitter, an ESB, any of those, bottle conditioning is really, really nice. Yeah, in, vintage in ales, it, you know, long time in that bottle, with the yeast and the sugar in there, it does make a significant difference to the finished result for that beer. It's why places like Fuller's bottle condition things like their vintage ale, right? Yeah, and actually the interaction between the yeast and the beer and what that actually does within the bottle is actually a really special thing. Let's not forget the Belgian styles as well. Yeah, absolutely. Because... And actually some of the, the bigger like 750s of like mixed fermentation, where actually you're almost treating it like champagne. You're adding some form of fermentable, you're add it, adding a, um, a yeast that is specifically for bottle conditioning and then leaving it to really let it mature and do its thing, right? Yeah. Those are really good examples of where that works. However, as we've touched on, some of the more modern styles, there are significant benefits from looking at different ways to carbonate. And actually in this video now, we're gonna talk quite extensively about the methods that are available for home brewers, and also thinking about some of the styles where you may wish to consider other methods. Now to kick off, we're gonna start by looking at actually how you can carbonate beer in bottles. Cause as we've already said, there are cases where this is absolutely the right thing to do. So first and foremost, we're gonna talk about how to, how to prime your bottles with sugar at the point when you are filling them, right? So Rob, you mentioned that you had a method that was kind of dialed in for you. What did you do? This is a really interesting topic because we argue about this constantly here at the malt miller especially between martin and i i've got the method where i will dose each individual bottle with the correct amount of sugar for the style of beer that i'm brewing and it works so well for me i know that each bottle has got the right amount of sugar in it it works really well well and also you can dial it in can't you because you are in control of how much sugar is going in the more you put in yeah the more fermentation is going to take place within the bottle therefore you're going to end up with more in the way of carbonation in the finished product. And there are charts and ways that you can kind of dial this in, but actually, like you said, through experience, you build up an understanding of the beer style versus the amount of sugar you may need to add. Now, you can also, what they call batch prime. Yep. So basically you are adding sugar to a bottling bucket perhaps, or you are making up a solution of sugar that you're adding to the beer before it's bottled. That's, in my opinion, a complete and utter waste of time. And it is fraught with a 
whole load of issues that can really put you wrong. That's why we argue about it so much. We, well, yes, we do. But there is a benefit potentially. No, there of, isn't. <laughs> okay. One of the benefits that people may argue is that by adding the full volume of sugar of extra fermentables to the beer before it's bottled means you've got equal distribution throughout the entire liquid. That's my Thus, very point, James. You haven't got that equal, you haven't got that equal distribution. It means you've got to stir a product that you really don't want to be stirring, you don't want to be agitating. It's fraught with a whole host of things that can go wrong. Yeah, and actually if you scale that up, the, the method of bottling homebrew and where, whether you add the sugar to the bottles or to the, uh, the the full volume, there is increased risk of things like introducing oxygen to your beer, right? Yeah, the one caveat on that is obviously when you've got re-fermentation inside the bottle, some of that oxygen can be scrubbed by that process. Yeah. However, there's also a good argument that says oxygen that's introduced to beer can't be scrubbed back out again so uh, well yeah for me, it's as gentle as you possibly can throughout the whole process yeah and there is the the issue of uh, the modern styles which we've already touched on now before we move on to some of the more modern methods that might suit those styles it's worth noting as well that uh, by doing you know bottle conditioning you've got to be in a position where you are absolutely confident about the amount of sugar that you're adding and that you have fully got rid of things like diacetyl that may cause another re-fermentation or that you've not left too much in the way of residual simple sugars in the beer so again which could cause re-fermentation because nobody wants a bottle bomb right yeah and actually to that point the very act of moving a fermenter onto a table and putting a positioning a bottle underneath it and then the action of the beer flowing into the bottle can actually re-churn up yeast and that can actually restart fermentation so yeah we've got to be careful yeah there are processes that need to be put into place but let's not forget that some of the more traditional styles the risks with that are lower where it does start to creep into higher risk is when you're increasing the abv yeah maybe if you're looking at like big stouts imperial stouts uh, vintage ale, something that's got a lot of residual sugar left in the beer, you know, that's when you maybe need to think about reducing the amount of sugar that you're adding into the bottle, in some cases not adding any, yeah. and then time being your friend and letting the maturation period really take place so that if you have got uh, residual sugars in there they're being eaten up over an extended period of time, um, thus minimizing the risk of, yeah, as we said, exploding bottles or just flipping the lid and getting the volcano, right? We've yeah. all had that. N no one wants that, it causes heartache. I don't want to have to paint my kitchen ceiling. Yeah, exactly. One very quick point is about crown caps. Now, all of the crown caps that we sell have what we call an oxygen scavenging like liner. Yeah, the, like a barrier that. that sits on the top, yeah, isn't it? And yeah, and that gets wet and it activates and it is another tool to help scrub that oxygen. Yeah. The caveat is what we said previously about oxygenating beer. Well, and, and on that, you know, once you've filled your bottles, making sure that actually you keep them upright, you keep them at a, a good temperature, an ambient temperature, so that that fermentation takes place without too much jostling, without introducing the oxygen that might be in the neck of the bottle before the crown cap has had the opportunity to scavenge it. Yeah. All of these little tips and tricks can actually lead to a far better bottle conditioned beer at the end. And also yeast choice as well. Some, some yeasts sediment on the bottom much, much better than others. Just one that springs to mind is Nottingham. It's known as a great bottle conditioning yeast because it sets like jelly on the bottom. So when you pour the bottle, it's more likely to stay on the bottom rather than in your glass. Now we're gonna take a look at some of the more modern approaches you can take to carbonating your beer. And actually, Rob, I'm gonna ask you a question. When was it apparent that you need to, needed to make the shift from bottle conditioning to kegging? It was more about the style of beer that I was making. So I very much started with British style traditional beers that, as we said, lend themselves to bottle conditioning. However, having visited the States, I got the taste for hops in a big way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and soon realized that they just don't lend themselves to, to being served out of a bottle as well as being served out of a keg. Plus, 
the idea of going to my own kegerator, pulling a pint for me and my wife and my mates out of my own beer that I've made, that I've kegged, that out of kegerator that I've made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bosh, it is man points were like up there yeah, i was absolutely delighted like that home tap room experience oh, see, right yeah, yeah you can't beat it and uh, i think uh, very similar to you um mine was driven out of a want to brew hazy new england style yeah. beers because my kind of beer origin whilst i was a beer lover before i became a beer addict at the point when those kind of styles emerged onto the scene yeah and it, it you know through uh, I want to say some trial and error, but actually more error than trial <laughs> of trying to bottle condition those beer styles. It was just evident I needed to make the shift. But also, it, there was a convenience thing, you know? For me, cleaning bottles every time I'd brewed a batch, the time it takes actually to fill those bottles, it, it was quite an extensive period of time invested into something and actually Kegin was going to speed that up for me. I'm going to disagree with you, James, because actually I tended to look at it as part of the brewing process. And if I want to be able to serve a nice English style beer out of a bottle, the bottling process is just something that I've got to do. My argument is that you can speed up that bottling process no end if you invest in the right equipment. So if you've got a, a bottle tree, if you've got a bench capper if you've got a squirty device so that you can clean the bottles properly with no rinse sanitizer it absolutely transforms bottling completely yeah i agree but i was really driven by this want and need to make hazy new england style pale ales yeah. and ipas yeah, yeah and that leads us on now really to talk about the different ways that you can carbonate a keg once you've got your wonderful homemade beer into it Let's look at the first way that you can carbonate a keg and one way that doesn't involve any extra equipment or anything else and that is batch prime in a keg almost the traditional way so that you are adding sugar to the keg letting it re-ferment in a sealed vessel yep uh, and then serving it directly out the keg now this method actually we're taking the things that we've done previously if you've been used to bottle conditioning batch priming those kind of things we're just taking exactly the same method and applying it to a larger vessel right yeah now the keg has a dip tube that runs right to the very bottom because the whole idea of a keg is it the last pint the keg is almost dry now obviously that springs into mind issues that are going to be caused by sediment in the bottom there are various different ways around it. You can chop the stainless steel dip tube so that it's a couple of inches off the bottom. Yep. Or you can use the floating dip tube type arrangement that is popular on the plastic pressure rated fermenters. And that actually works, works very well because obviously it's drawing beer from the very top of the keg. Yeah, and you can also add to that one of the nice little mesh baskets yeah, yeah. to act as a filter. So, you know, if you haven't got some form of inline filter or if you have re-fermented in the keg and you just want to add another layer of protection to drawing sediment, hot matter, that kind of stuff in, they're really nice, those little, those little baskets that you can add. We do need to talk about people that ferment in the keg with a normal stainless steel dip tube and there's quite a lot of talk uh, around social media and the internet about you can pour the first couple of pints and you get the sediment and then you're into clear beer. I'm talking from personal experience, I have never ever managed to get that to happen. Yeah. I, if it's cloudy, it stays cloudy throughout the whole keg. That's for me, I'm sure that other people have actually managed to do it. I've never managed to do it and it causes other problems as well, as in you move the keg, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. back into completely cloudy beer again. It, it, if you've got like two or three taps on your kegerator or keyser and you need to jostle things around to fit it in, yeah, you're gonna kick that sediment back up again, aren't you, right? Like all things in home brewing, I'm sure that that is a, a method that works for some people. Me standing here personally, it's never worked for me. If you do choose to batch prime your keg with uh, with enough sugar to re-ferment in the keg, again, you can use exactly the same calculators and methods that you will have used previously if you're used to doing this uh, before bottling, because the amount of sugar really to achieve the same level of carbonation, it's, it's gonna be roughly the same. So like I said, if you're already doing this in the bottling world, then it might be a great place to start for you uh, with a keg. 
Now we're gonna come on to our second method for carbonating your beer in a keg. And actually this method sits somewhere in between the third and fourth method, which we're gonna come on to, all right? And we're talking now about force carbonating your beer. Rob, what do we mean by force carbonation and how might you go about it? So we are gonna have a keg that's full of beer that we've transferred from our fermenter. We know that that keg is oxygen free. We've spoken about that previously and there's videos about that subject. So I would then add my CO2 at about 30 PSI. I would get it in the fridge and I would just leave it. Yeah. So that is much higher than serving pressure and I need to keep a check on that beer. So every 12 hours or so, I would go back to that keg, I'd draw some off, I'd have a little sneaky taste and see how we're getting on. It's hard life as a home brewer, right? Um, but that method is actually, that's how I often do this, unless I'm in a real pinch. But it means that I can keg a beer on a Monday, yeah. and I know that by Friday, it will have carbonated well, it will have had a little bit of time to settle down and really homogenize. And the benefit of this is that you're gonna end up with a carbonation consistency, and I do use that term yeah, quite, important. quite rightly, um, that means that you know the bubbles are gonna be nice and fine, uh, and also I get to experience what that carbonation takes tastes like throughout the process because you know a beer that's maybe got a, a lower carbonation might be better suited than leaving it to carbonate really highly so it's a really nice sensory experience doing it that way. We're also massive advocates of tasting the beer right throughout the whole stage right from grain right throughout fermentation and right throughout the carbonation process it is teaching you so much. Yeah absolutely. So once I have got to my desired carbonation level I then turn the beer or turn the regulator down, the CO2 that's been delivered to the keg, I turn that down to what I think is gonna be my serving pressure. Nice. So the third method that we're looking at, James, is you call it rough and ready, I call it shaky shaky, and I'm sure there are scientists amongst you that are absolutely crying into their cornflakes. However, it really, really works for me. This method of carbonation, I love it. It is super quick super easy gives me a workout at the same time yeah it's the method that i use yeah and I, I have to confess me too because i'm not the most planned person and times you know i think well i've got that beer in the fermenter i really should keg it and then each evening i really should keg it and then it gets to like thursday night and i'm like i want to be drinking this beer at the weekend yeah what am I going to do? So, I know what you're going to do, James. You're going to force carbonate by carbonate it by shaking it. Yeah. That's now, the now the way I do this uh, differs from from some people, but the way I like to do it is get the beer in the keg as per the previous method. Purge all the oxygen. Make sure that I'm really comfortable that I've got zero oxygen in the keg. Hook up the gas disconnect. Yeah. Set it to about 30 psi, and then. I embark on a journey of shaking. <laughs> yeah. Now, some people will say that they'll lay the keg down and roll it, and they'll sit there rolling it with their foot, yeah. you know, and that works for them, that's fine, because you're increasing the surface area for the carbon dioxide to absorb into the beer. The way I do it, actually, is I hook the gas line to the beer out post on the keg. So imagine that I'm creating ultimately like a giant soda stream. I do know, yeah. And I can then just rock the keg the right way up and I can hear the CO2 bubbling up through. And I know that because the keg's not open, all, every time it's bubbling up through, that means that CO2 is being absorbed into the beer. It's really quick. Some people will say, choose your favorite song, play it by the time you finish playing the song your beer will be done um, I've got a favorite song that I choose to put on which is about three and a half minutes long but the benefit of this method is that you can get a beer carbonated really quickly now there are some considerations definitely there are some considerations and I will disagree with your down the down the beer out tube because it, it I find it doesn't work for me um, I will connect it to the normal gas post and I will literally pick up the keg and I will physically shake it. 30 PSI, a minute of shaking. Um, I will then leave it alone for a couple of hours. I'll then repeat it. I'll then leave the keg alone 
try it the next day yeah. and make sure that I've got the right level of carbonation. Yeah, and actually that's where we're similar. So I'll do that and I will leave it for a few hours to really let that carbonation level settle down because as you're introducing CO2 and then shaking it, it naturally you're gonna build up some foam in the keg yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So you actually, need to let it to, to calm down. And actually this is a really good point to bring up the Coke bottle analogy. So if you've got a a two litre bottle of Coke that you've just been shaking around, you know what's gonna happen if you take the lid off. Yep. It's gonna be very messy. So oh, yeah. just think of a keg, which is a closed pressure vessel, exactly the same way as you would do a bottle of Coke, because your beer's gonna act exactly the same inside there. Yeah. And then once it's been sat for a couple of hours, I'll then try it and I'll yeah. see how I feel with it. If I need to, I'll add a little bit more, but equally if I wanna dump a bit of the CO2 out, I can just purge what we call burp yeah, in the yeah. keg yeah open the prv let as much co2 out as i feel is appropriate without drawing any oxygen in and then what will happen is over the next couple of hours some of that co2 will escape into the void thus bringing the carbonation level down a little bit i do want to repeat that they are very scientific ways to introduce co2 into your beer and if that's your chosen route that's absolutely fine and um, it's just that this what I call like the shaky shaky method just is so quick and so easy for me. Yeah, the the one downside in my experience to it is that the carbonation doesn't tend to be as, as fine as um, when you force carbonate over an extended period of time. But time, if you if you do the shake method and then leave it, you get the same absor absorption into the beer anyway. Yeah. So if you want to serve it straight away, you're going to be the, on those big bubbles. It's not it's not um, dissolved into the beer fully enough. Yeah. If you do it and then leave it cold, it it uniformly dissipates with yeah, the beer. Yeah, it homogenizes and exactly. yeah, it gets all good. Yeah. Now the fourth method that we've got for carbonating your beer in a keg is the more scientific approach and arguably, you know, the best way to do it if you're really planned in your home brewing hobby. Now, what we're talking about here is very similar to the other two methods, get the beer in the keg, making sure that it is completely oxygen free, then we're gonna hook it up to gas. Now, at that point, where does it differ, Rob? What we're doing is a measured amount of CO2 at a measured, temperature for a measured amount of time. That way the CO2 absorbs within the beer and we get to the carbonation level that we've actually planned. And this is where you really can get to the, almost the exact volume of CO2 that you want in that beer for that beer style or your particular taste. Yeah, and there are loads of charts available that actually give you the exact time frame, the pressure based on the temperature, everything you need to really dial that in and perfect it. And, and if you've got the time, we would thoroughly recommend that yeah. this is the best way to do it. You get that really nice, even distribution of CO2, nice, tight, small bubbles. You dial in the specific level that you want for the beer style. And also, you know, if you're in the world of entering into homebrew competitions, yeah. if you're going to be bottling your beer from a keg to then send off, the judges are going to be looking for the appropriate oh, level of carbonation. Massive, it's a massive part of the beer style, the level of carbonation within the beer. So it's it really is important. And if you've got that scientific approach to things, this is exactly where you want to occupy, all right? So the other methods are potential shortcuts, different ways of doing it um, that maybe suit for certain circumstances. But if you're really focused on nailing that style, we can't advocate this method highly enough. You can also go into using various equipment for doing that as well. We have keg lids that have got a carbonation stone on a CO2 line that actually dangles inside the beer. So you're dissipating that CO2 gently. Now with the rise in popularity of the plastic pressure rated fermenters. Yeah, and pressure fermenting in general. Definitely. It's worth looking at beer being produced in the fermenter that's naturally carbonated because we've fermented it under pressure so that we can either serve it directly out of the vessel or transfer it oxygen free into a keg that we're then serving. Absolutely. But basically we're looking at using the natural CO2 that's produced during fermentation to actually carbonate the beer 
killing two birds with one stone, basically. The uh, best way to think of this is, if you take what we were talking about at the very beginning of the uh, of the video, where we were saying about bottle conditioning, um, using the sugar to create more CO2, which then gets dissolved in the bottle, with pressure fermenting, we're doing that on a bigger scale, but we're not adding additional sugars because the sugars that are being consumed by the yeast are what's creating the CO2, which is then getting absorbed back in. And we can be really controlled with this yeah. through using some technology um, and some pieces of equipment that, again, have become really accessible recently. And at fantastic price points as well. So what we're looking at basically is spunding valves, fermented under pressure with the use of a spunding valve, it's got a scientific approach because we know what the carbonation level of the beer is going to be at the end because we've controlled the amount of pressure within the keg. It's an awesome method. Yeah. So the way we do this is we have our fermenter filled with beer. We add our yeast. So everything there is pretty, pretty standard. But then all of these pressure vessels that we now have available to us have a sealed lid. So you cap the tank, you're creating a sealed environment that has gas posts and liquid posts on it in the same way that a keg does. Yeah. But then we add a spunding valve to one of those, or in some cases with the, the more comprehensive unitanks and other pressure fermenters, you know, a dedicated spunding valve that gets fitted onto it, much like you'd see in a commercial brewery. By dialing in the spunding valve, you can control the amount of CO2 that's being left in the vessel, which then corresponds directly to the amount of CO2 that's being absorbed into the beer, right? Exactly. And it's also worth talking about different styles you want to ferment under pressure in different ways. Yeah. So the very essence of fermenting under pressure for something like a lager so that we can use a lager yeast at a higher temperature and rush the fermentation so it's really quick without the off flavors that would normally be associated with that, that's absolutely fine for that style. If I'm doing a massively hopped West Coast or New England style IPA, I don't want to be fermenting that under high pressure because yeah. you're also going to be muting those very flavors that you want to really enhance. So you have to choose when you cap that fermenter very wisely and that goes on the style of beer that you're trying to produce. Now the other benefit of this method or, or this technology using these fermenters is if you are brewing one of those hoppy, hazy, you know, highly charged beers that we know and love, what you can do is at the end of fermentation, once all of those lovely compounds have been created and the aromas have been released and the hops have done their thing, you can then add CO2 to the fermenter and in essence, do what we were talking about with the kegs by force carbonating, but in that fermenter. So it's a really versatile method, but with a lot of them as well, you can serve directly from the fermenter. Yeah. They've got collection vessels, so you can take the yeast and the hops off the bottom. There is floating a, dip tube. Yeah, yep. floating dip tube. There is a trade-off because of the size of them, trying to get those into like a, a serving chamber of some sort. But there are other methods that you can use this method in conjunction with um, to then go on to further package, which we're going to come on to now. Now, if we've piqued your interest about pressurized fermentation, we've got an awesome playlist that really digs into the topic. So I'll put it up here for you to check out. But let's look a bit closer on how you can package from one of those pressurated uh, fermenters into a keg. Rob, how might we go about doing that? Basically, we're using the carbonation that's built up within the fermenter plus an external source of CO2 to push the beer from the fermenter into the keg and we can do that completely oxygen free. Yeah, nice. And then there is also the closed loop method as well, which allows you to kind of minimize your CO2 usage. It's quite a clever way of using gravity and carbon yeah. dioxide. But again, we've got some videos on both of those topics that I'd encourage you to check out. What about putting beer into bottles from one of those fermenters when it's carbonated. I mean, if you were going to be entering a beer into a competition or give it to some friends, yeah. that might be why you would want to put it into a bottle. But how do we go about that? We've got bottling guns and they work brilliantly. So they're actually designed to fill carbonated product into a, into a bottle. You can purge the bottle first with CO2 and then add the product. And it does it in a nice, gentle way to absolutely minimize fobbing. Yeah, and the other way that works very similar to that is the counter pressure fillers, right? The difference there is that they're gonna add additional CO2 into the bottle and hold the pressure. 
and they kind of balance the pressure between the keg, the flow, and the bottle to really minimize that fobbing. It's super gentle, right? Yeah, it is. It's actually a really nice way to package beer. However, the flip side is it's quite involved. Yeah. Now, if you've found this of use, please hit us up in the comments below. Equally, if you've got different methods that we haven't covered during this, because I'm sure there's gonna be other ways that you approach carbonation at home with your beer, we'd love to hear about them. So drop us in the comments below. And also I'd like to say that within everything within homebrew, there are a hundred different ways of doing it. And what suits one person might not suit another. I can't wait to see your comments about what we've said about the way that we use to carbonate our beer for serving at home. And it would be remiss of me to not say, please like the video, subscribe to the channel. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a great brew.